How are you, Christ Universal Temple? It's good, it's always good to be with you. As, as my mother says, it's always good to be with the blessed people of the Lord. God bless you. Um, yeah, that's you. I know. Yeah, like, is he talking about us? We're not sure. Is that us? Are we the blessed? Are we the blessed people? Yeah, that's you. That's that's you. You can clap for yourself. It's you. Yeah, yeah, that's you. Uh, so, uh, Reverend Boyd has uh, beautifully and skillfully, masterfully um, it walked us into this uh, working with the law. And on today, our topic is. Um, an, an important topic when it comes to um, the, the consciousness around working the law and how building that consciousness uh, oftentimes manifests itself through a prosperous living. But before we, we move into the heart of the lesson, I just want to point out just a few facts. Um, just in the event that you might, uh, for whatever reason, be, be thinking yourself uh, as, as not prosperous and not um, blessed abundantly, uh, because at any time we begin to think about uh, prosperity, I think it's always important to uh, be on the lookout. Um, in, in, in the uh, Chicago Police Department, they have this thing called uh, uh, BOLO, be on the lookout, right? And so as, as uh, Christian metaphysicians, we, also, we always have to be on the lookout for something to uh, praise and give thanks for. And so uh, we all have so much to give thanks for. Uh, you are rich, I am rich, not just in spirit, but, but financially speaking, we, we, we are rich. We can always be better, but we are rich. Um, just a couple quick stats. If your income is $25,000 per year or more, you are richer than 90% of the populace. $25,000 or more, you are richer than 90% of the populace. If your income, your household income is 50% or more, you are richer than 99% of the populace. So there are 6.7 billion global citizens and most of them live on less than $2 per day. Those of you who know me know that I am a Starbucks drinker every now and again and just the accruements that I put into my coffee or tea generally cost more than $2 per day, right? And so I just don't want to waste an opportunity for you to recognize that you are abundantly blessed and supplied. So as we enter into um, this lesson, it's important to recognize that prosperity does not mean the same thing to everyone, right? For some of us, the idea of prosperity fills us with doubt, meaning that not only do we not receive it well, but we view or perceive those who uh, receive prosperity or who have a prosperity consciousness or focus. We view them with a certain amount of skepticism and doubt. It always bewilders me that we would get up and go to work and uh, on the backside of that not want to be blessed and benefited from the work that we did during the course of the day. I believe we get up and go to work because we know that um, if you don't pay your bills, the ComEd people and the water people and the mortgage people and the rent people, all of those people will come looking for you and they won't care that you have doubts about prosperity. <laughs> they will expect you to be in harmony and in sync with the law of transfer. That means if they give you service, they want their money in return. And it's difficult to provide for the service if you don't have the substance by which to meet that. And so if, by chance, not you, but somebody you know, has a hang-up about the doubts with whether or not they should be prosperous, let me just remind you of the words of the master teacher, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I don't know about you, but abundance in my lexicon doesn't mean a little bit of anything. Abundance from my standpoint, as I have been taught, means that there is more than enough to do everything that I need to do. Then, at the other end of the spectrum, there are those of us who, when we think about prosperity, we think about um, uh, success and, and more things. The more things we have, the more prosperous we feel. We, we, we think that it's, it's about just getting, doing all that we can to get more and get more and get more stuff. And there's nothing wrong with having nice stuff. 
I am one who uh, is good with having nice stuff. But nice stuff is not necessarily equivalent to being prosperous, right? A, 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 a nice car with a broken relationship with the person who would ride in your passenger seat is not really prosperous. A bank account with a body that won't allow you to go to wherever you want to go to spend the money that you have is not necessarily consistently uh, with what we would call prosperous. Does that make sense? And so it is important for us to have an idea of what we mean, and by we, I mean you. You ought to know what you mean when you say and or hear the word prosperity, because it does not mean the same thing to every one of us. Is that right? And so, as we begin to look at prosperity today, I want us to have an opportunity to approach the idea of prosperity uh, from the perspective of the a practical, pragmatic, metaphysical Christian. I want us to have an opportunity to approach the idea of prosperity from the practical or pragmatic perspective of the metaphysical Christian. So for the metaphysical Christian, what do you mean, Rev, when you say metaphysical Christian? I mean a Christ-minded person, say Christ-minded person, Christ a Christ-minded person who looks searches, seeks, examines, and watches above and beyond what is appearing. If you've studied anything about Jesus, you know that Jesus was not terribly consumed with the things that appeared as they appeared. Two, three, four, five thousand people hungry, this master teacher without seeing physically what was needed to provide for the people, would say, y'all just sit down and let me put my faith to work so that we can break the substance and bless the substance so that everybody who's hungry might have an opportunity to eat. I love the consciousness that says everybody eats. Does that make sense? And so when we are talking about prosperity from the standpoint of the metaphysical Christian, the Christian a pragmatist, we are talking about the Christ-minded person who looks, say looks, put this in your notes, looks, searches, seeks, examines, and watches above and beyond what is appearing. If you are considering yourself a metaphysical Christian and you are stuck on what is appearing, you are practicing malpractice as a metaphysical Christian. And you will consistently find yourself frustrated because the call, the challenge that is put before you is to see be above and beyond what is appearing. And so if we are comfortable judging things as they appear, we will find ourselves unable to reconcile why what appearing, why what is appearing continues to appear. If you want to have something different, you've got to see something different. Does that make sense? And so then, for the Christian metaphysician, prosperity is defined this way. Prosperity is the consciousness of God. Say consciousness of God. As the abundant everywhere, present resource, unfailing, ready for all who open themselves to it through faith. So then prosperity, uh, irrespective of how you decide to define it, for the metaphysical Christian is defined as God, and the prosperity is the consciousness of God or the mind of God as abundant everywhere, already ready for you. I want you to get that. Because what we understand in Isaiah, if we can bring our thoughts up to the ways of God, or if we can think the thoughts of God after God, what we will find is if we can think the thoughts of God after God, then the ways of God will become our ways. And so if the way of God is abundant everywhere, unfailing, then there is no opportunity for you to fail when you are plugged into God's prosperity. Man, I hope you got that. 
I hope you got that. You can't fail, you can't lose. It doesn't matter what they say, where you come from, who you know, how much you know, how little you know. If you understand God as prosperity, you cannot fail. Doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. If you understand God as unfailing prosperity, you can't fail. And so then prosperity as the consciousness or the mind of God. We got to stop right there. We got to stop right there. If it is the mind of God, then it is the mind of good. And if it is the mind of good, and this mind takes on the a characteristic of God as everywhere, then, oh man, uh, then that means that good is everywhere. You ready? So one of the things that trips us up, Judge, is when we judge, I, you said I just did that, I didn't, I didn't do that. <laughs> I should have used somebody else. One of the things that trips us up is when we judge, we judge it according to how it appears, not according to the omnipresent good. And so the more consistently we judge it according to how it appears, the more consistently our consciousness is not being impacted by God consciousness, but rather by the appearance consciousness. And every time we let the world inform us about who we are, what we are supposed to have, how we can have it, we find ourselves being confused with this idea that great is synonymous with hate. It's only born out of the idea that somebody has to have less in order for you to have more. But if we understand that God, good, is omnipresent, there is no opportunity to judge anything outside of the one. Are you still with me? And so the more consistently I learn to condition my thinking and my feeling to only see the one, the less likely I am to see two. And a double-minded Christian metaphysician is unstable in all of their ways. See, we're wondering why it's not working. It's working. It's, you just don't know how to control your mind to get it to work the way you want it to work. So then... If prosperity is the consciousness of God as the abundant, everywhere present resource, unfailing and ready to open itself to all of us who come to it by faith, then what we must do if we understand prosperity is search for what God intends. What you looking for? When you engage with somebody and y'all start talking, what are you listening for? Are you listening for the blessing that they came to bring and that you came to bring? Because if you recognize that God is everywhere present, unfailing good, you will seek that in every encounter. You have to learn to search for it, though. See, some things are not obvious at first. Some things you really do have to take a second look. You have to uh, look at it again. You have to uh, not settle for seeing it as it appears on the surface. Some things you have to search for. For many of us, we haven't experienced our greatest self because we ain't searching hard enough. We settle for the sense that we are the mistakes that we make. How many of you know that the mistakes that you make are only intended to make you search deeper? Right? So the fact that you may be a bad judge in character doesn't mean that you don't have to search for your character. Are you still with me? If we recognize that the God intention as prosperity is an unfailing, everywhere present resource, then we have to seek it everywhere. Everywhere. See, I, I think there's a scripture that says, ask, and it shall be, seek, and you shall, 
knock. So if it's everywhere and you seek it, the next step then is to knock, and if you knock, it has to open itself to you. So many of us are struggling, not you, maybe somebody in your row, many of us are struggling because we haven't opened the door or opened ourselves to the very thing we say we want. This, this, is this, you, you, you good with me? You, you, you flowing with me? All right, all right. So then as, as, as Reverend Boyd reminded us, there are mental and spiritual laws at work. And those laws say that a changed experience can only come from a changed individual. And a changed individual can only be the result of a changed consciousness. Are you with me? And yet the research shows that the odds are against people making change. The, odd, the odds are nine to one that we will make the change that we need to make even if it's a life-threatening situation. The odds are against it. I remember hearing uh, Dana Brownie tell a story about uh, being at church with a grandmother. And just as they were leaving, one of the ushers stopped them and said to the, to the grandmother, uh, don't forget to be back in time enough for uh, at 7 o'clock. I don't know if there was a, a, a rehearsal or a revival. I don't remember what she said it was. And uh, he said the grandmother asked, is that seven o'clock old time or seven o'clock new time? <laughs> and the usher said, seven o'clock new time. And so as Dana and, 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 her, and her relatives looked at grandma with that confused look, well, grandma, what's, what's old time? And grandma said, well, well, child, some folks in the church um, don't believe in changing their clock when daylight saving times come. <laughs> so they don't turn it forward or they don't turn it back. They just leave it where it is. And so the way we distinguish here is we simply say, is it old time or new time? So for the people who didn't change their clocks back, they consider it old time. And for everybody else, it's new time. And so the question then becomes, um, what patterns of thought what deeply held beliefs, what ways of being, what attitudes and dispositions are keeping you at all time and unable to spring forward to your new season that you've been praying for? It's just a question. Because here's what we know. If we keep doing what we've been doing, we will keep getting what we've been getting. And so then a change in consciousness is the only answer. So how do we then facilitate change in the soul? I'm so glad you asked. And, and, and listen, I'm not tripping, I'm not tripping, I'm not judging, because I do recognize from my very own experience that this teaches simple. It does difficult. So it's easier, to, it's easier to talk it than it is to teach it, and it's easier to teach it than it is to live it. I'm just keeping it uh, 50,000 with you. So if we want to change, if we want to change, if we want to change consciousness, one of the first things that we must do is make sure that the desire to change is not just a surface motivation. Many of us only want to change because of the circumstances that are at hand. And so when the wind blows and beats upon that house and you give your life to God in a new and recommitted way, no sooner than the wind has passed onto your neighbor's house are we back to the same old ways of being. But the same ways of being brings back to you the same experiences that the winds blew on your house in the first place. So when we think about change, it is important that we commit ourselves to being changed at a deep and significant level. So in order to change at a deep and significant level, you have to commit yourself to no longer settle for less than you deserve. So let me show you where to start at. And let me show you where to start at when it comes to settling for less than you deserve. Refuse to settle for anything less than your divine nature. 
I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what the circumstances are. I don't care what the people around you have to say. Remind yourself again and again and again and again. I am divine by nature. I am the child of the most high God. I am a spiritual being living in a spiritual universe that's governed by spiritual law. Everything in the world is working on my behalf because God intends it for my good. If God is for me, who can be against me? Everything works together for my good because I love the Lord and I'm called according to his purpose. You got to bring yourself back out of the mist and be able to stand firmly in the truth about who you are and whose you are. But it takes commitment to that. Because the moment somebody look at you cross, it's right back into that victim consciousness. Who they think they're looking at? Who they think they're talking about? Who you talking about? You talking about me? I know she ain't talking about me. I know she ain't looking at me like that. Who you think you're going to do like that? You think you can do me like that? I'm about to give you a piece of my mind. The more pieces you give away, the less peace you have. You ain't figured that out yet? Stop giving away pieces of your mind and start reclaiming for yourself pieces of your divinity. I think the scripture says it this way, I will let nothing and no one disturb the calm peace of my soul. It takes a big person to walk away from an argument, especially when you write. And of course you're always right. But check it, check it, check it. The spiritual you and the right you might not be rolling together. The spiritual you and the divine you, or the divine you and the right you, probably don't care. Because what the divine you recognizes is that you have attracted this experience to yourself. To turn over the tables in your own soul. Right, you ain't got to turn over the tables in nobody else's temple. Just turn over the tables in your own soul. Just kick the money changers out of your consciousness where the money changers are saying you don't deserve to be prospered, you don't deserve to be blessed, you are less than, you don't deserve. Get rid of those money changers, kick them out the temple. Are you still with me? So what we have to realize is that our mental attention can and must be controlled. One of the things that I love and appreciate about high-functioning people is they only talk about what they want. They never talk about what they don't want. And so what you talking about? Number two, number two, number two. So the first thing is, is we have to facilitate change in the soul. We facilitate change in the soul by not making a surface decision, but making a committed decision to bring ourselves back to the truth about who we are, spiritual beings living in a spiritual universe that's governed by spiritual law. The second thing I want to encourage you to do is remember, say remember, remember. that the primary cause of suffering is forgetfulness. And if the primary cause of suffering is forgetfulness, then the primary cause of prosperity is? I, the, well, the, the, the four of y'all that said it just threw me off so bad. That's a layup. I put it right there for you. So let's try it one more time. Follow me. Think with me. <clears throat> Think with me. If the primary cause of suffering is forgetfulness, Right? That the primary cause of suffering is forgetfulness. Then the primary cause of prosperity is. There you go. I know you know it. I still want you to sign up for a class, though, because y'all was real slow with that. Shouldn't be that slow. Right? And so if the primary cause of suffering is forgetfulness, then the primary cause of prosperity is to remember. Remember, 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 remember you are seeking ideas and mental attitudes to facilitate prosperity and these ideas are everywhere. You are seeking the ideas. When you pray to God to answer your question, God doesn't send you something out of the sky. God sends you an idea and a creative thought. 
And if God sends you an idea and a creative thought and you don't know how to work with ideas, when the idea comes, it, call, it falls upon a soil that's not even ready to give 30%, 60%, or 100%. And so we stay stuck wondering why God is not responding. And God is saying, you keep praying about something I already gave you an idea for. Put your creative thought to work. Use the tools that you have. See, one of the beautiful things about the grace of God's provision is that it never leaves us without the tools. And so we are, say, I am. I am, I am a thinker. I am a thinker. So it's not the material thing, but rather it's the creative thought combined with the idea that gives me the solution to the problem that I have. Oh, man, I just gave you the formula. That's it. That's it. Get that, go home. <laughs> Done. You're straight. You got it. I just gave it to you. In the, in the words of Jay-Z, I just gave you a billion dollars worth of info. What's better than one billionaire? Two. I just gave it to you. Free. So then, if what we are to work with is ideas through creative thought, and if these ideas are unfailing and everywhere, then you don't really have a problem. You, you, you got that? If, if what you have to work with is the idea and the creative thought, if these are your tools, and if you have them and the ideas are everywhere and the creative thought is within your power, you have what you need. The challenge is, the challenge is that most of us think we only have one tool. And we think that tool is a hammer. And uh, you probably know like I do that if the only tool you have a, is a hammer, then every problem has to be a nail. But let me, let, me, let, me, let me run this down for you. Understand that adults learn by problem solving. When problems show up in your life, world, and affairs, when adversity shows up, it shows up so that you might apply the creative thought through the use of the creative idea to provide a creative solution to the challenge that caused you to stretch and grow. It's not intended to take you down. It's intended to make you tap your resourcefulness. It's intended to remind you that there is an unfailing, everywhere present resource. And that unfailing, everywhere present resource knows that you have the tools you need to build the life you desire. Watch this. And until you get your act together and use the tools that are available to you, the winds come and the storm beats on the house because it's not going to let you go. <laughs> See, what you gotta realize is that you're here to be the solution. And so the problem is not just so that you can figure out the solution. The problem is so that you can live a prosperity-filled, fulfilling life through your ability to use creative thought to the challenges that meet the needs of somebody else. You, 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 you hearing me? And so, and so, and so, um, um, uh, Anne, Anne, Anne ran, Anne ran. She said that, that um, most people don't realize that wealth is the product of creative thinking. There was another person who said, um, uh, poor-minded people will never experience prosperity. And so one of the ways that you can tell if you are poor-minded, not you, because I know you're not poor-minded, but one of the ways that you can tell if the people you hang out with because not only do you have to be mindful about you, you got to be mindful about the people you hang out with. It's a, it's a heck of a thing to be unevenly yoked. Ray, 
Raymond Charles Barker said that you were born, <laughs> this is good, this is good, Ray, this is good, Ray. He said you were born to be a dynamic. Can you read that? Can you see that? Yeah. Read that with me. He said you were born to be a dynamic thinker of great ideas producing interesting experiences for yourself and others, the equipment to do this you have. Man, that's dope right there. You get that? And so that's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to be. Can I show you where we trip ourselves up at? Um, Eleanor Roosevelt said that the challenge for many of us is that we don't realize that what we talk about is a reflection of what we think about. And so, I, I, to paraphrase her, to paraphrase her, so dynamic minds talk about ideas. Mediocre minds talk about events. Small minds talk about people. I can't wrap this lesson up without asking you, what are you talking about most consistently? Because that shows you the intention with which you are approaching the law. No judgment, no judgment. Say judgment free zone. Say it, say it, say it. Judgment free zone. Say judgment free space. No judgment. Just point it out. Because you can't fix what you won't face. Does that make sense? So number three, let me just give you this and let's 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 keep it, let's keep it moving. Let me give you this and let's keep it moving. Because I, I want you to be able, I want you to be able to, to open yourself up. I want you to be able to open yourself up because it's ready and available to all who open themselves up. I don't want you to make the assumption that you're already open to it. Particularly not if the way you think and the way you believe are not in alignment with what you say you want. You know as I do, sometimes the tongue in our mouth and the tongue in our shoe is not moving in the same direction. Right? So here, 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 here is one of the ways I want you to be able to tell. Number three, number three, number three. I want you to open yourself up by wanting for others that which you say you want for yourself. If you say you want peace, I want you to want peace for the person that you're arguing with. If you say that you want peace, I want you to want peace for the person that you ain't speak to last night nor this morning. If you say you want peace, I want you to want peace for the people who ain't paying you what you worth. If you say you want prosperity, I want you to want prosperity for, for, the, for the folk who won't move from in front of your doorstep no matter how many times or how nicely you ask. If you say you want it, I want you to uh, give it away first. And as you give it away, what your giving does is show you and the creative capacity that you are wanting to give and you can't give without being open. Does that make sense? And so I want you to uh, just begin to want for others what you want for yourself in golf. One of, the, one of the unspoken rules, one of the unspoken rules is that when your uh, playing partners, people who are in your foursome, when they're standing over a putt, you, it's, it's, you, you never uh, want them to miss the putt. Because what I believe golfers realize is that everything that I feel when I'm wanting you to miss, I'm the only one feeling it. And the way that I feel does not impact your stroke. And so I just want you to get in the habit of, to take on the disposition of, wanting the best for others. Because when you want the best for others, what you soon come to realize is that there can't be an other if there's only one. And prosperity belongs to the one. God bless you.